Okay, great. Thanks, Pascar. Well, thank you everybody for uh, attending and watching this session live. Um, so in this session, I'm going to talk about uh, how do you create dynamic web XR experiences with Angular and A-Frame. Uh, and this is how you can build some virtual reality, augmented reality, maybe later on some mixed rea reality experiences. Um, so before we get into the content, just some, uh, some information here. So the, the show notes, my slides, uh, video, um, will all be posted to the link that you see here. Um, and I think, Baskar, you'll probably provide this maybe in a follow-up. Um, if you go to that link, um, you can also register to win a free T-shirt. And then um, all the all the code that I'm showing today during this session there is located at my GitHub uh, link uh, as seen here. And that'll also be in the show notes. So you can you can look at that a little bit later. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, Jeff Fry, I'm a senior technical alliance manager at JFrog. I'm on the business development team. Um, but in the former life, I was an engineer, actually just until recently. Um, and the language and engineering side, I, I have interest in TypeScript, JavaScript. Um, I really like Go. Um, and then I have a, a background in, in Java. Uh, on the fun side of things, I enjoy motorsports. I used to race uh, here in the U.S., SACA. I follow Formula One. And I have a son that's it's, uh, six years old, coming up on seven. We enjoy racing carts together. Uh, so I'm trying to pass that on to him. And then uh, ever since uh, the initial Oculus Kickstarter project, um, I've been a v virtual reality, augmented reality, MR enthusiast. So I've been playing around with this uh, for a few years now. Um, if you want to follow me, um, I'm on Twitter at Jeffrey Fry. And then uh, my, my GitHub account is Jeffrey Fry as well. All right, so let's get into this. Let's get some background on um, WebXR and virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and uh, mixed reality. So if you remember back uh, 2012, there was quite a bit of hype um, with virtual reality. This is when you had the, that Oculus Kickstarter project. Um, you know, right around 2013 timeframe, they released their development kit one. Uh, then there was their development kit two. Um, some of you might be familiar with Unity and Unreal. These are started out as game or, or graphics engines for creating um, uh, 3D video games, first-person video games. Right around the 2015 timeframe, uh, they added support for Oculus. So you can start creating uh, some of these virtual reality environments within Unity. Um, it was still kind of complex. Uh, it required writing some C-sharp code. Uh, a lot of interaction in the Unity ID or Unreal ID environment. Um, so it, it wasn't quite easy at that point. Um, and then right around the 2016 timeframe, you had the, the Oculus Consumer Edition that came out. Then you also had Pokemon augmented reality on your phones, if you remember that. Um, and then right around 2016, you had something called the WebVR API project. And this was a precursor to WebXR. So this was um, providing device APIs within devices and browsers to um, provide uh, virtual reality experiences. And so you would build uh, programming languages on top of this. Um, this was pushed by Mozilla and Google. Um, it also relied on WebGL as well to do some of the rendering. Um, and then you followed up with HoloLens and Magic Leap. This is when you started having the mixed reality come in. And then uh, I think it was right around the 2018 timeframe is when WebVR transitioned to WebXR. So that was adding the additional support for um, augmented reality and, and mixed reality. And so just to kind of provide some definitions on VR, AR, and MR, what they are. So <clears throat> we are all pretty familiar with uh, virtual reality, the Oculus headsets, the Oculus Quest. You know, you put these on and then you're just immersed in a, virtual reality, digital environments. Um, augmented reality is, is different. Um, this is an overlay onto your physical world. And so again, using Poke Pokemon as an example, this is having those Pokemon monsters just kind of roaming around in your environment, catching them. Mixed reality is, you can consider it like a, a augmented reality on steroids. And these would be virtual visual objects that interact with your reality environment or your real environment. 
And so a really good analogy of this is if you had like a, a virtual ball that bounced around on the furniture or the table in your room. Um, so this is what mixed reality is. And uh, we're not quite there. You're starting to see some of that in HoloLens and Magic Leap. Um, so that's, that's something that's coming in the near future. Uh, over here on the right, I kind of wanted to also show that the hype cycle, um, this is a graph that you can, that's been uh, shared, shared widely. So back in that 2011, 2012 timeframe, there's a lot of hype around virtual reality in that uh, that disillusionment occurred right after that as people kind of realized that uh, these devices were hard to build, was hard to develop virtual reality experiences. And so I'm hoping, because I'm an enthusiast, that we're kind of entering that time frame now where you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, we might find those productive use cases when they start becoming more popular. And we start having those devices that have been uh, more miniaturized, more, more convenient to wear. Um, and so, you know, it hopefully picks up popularity. So let's talk a bit about WebXR. Again, this was the transition from WebVR. Uh, so WebXR is a device API to bring VR and AR and MR to the web. Uh, so it provides browser and device support. And so that this is a list of some of the browsers that currently support it and, and devices as well. Um, so it's an API that manages the, the VR, AR, MR inputs and outputs to a device. So that, that API handles inputs to the device as far as inputs from controllers, could be the touch screen. Um, it could be like in the case of Oculus, those hand controls. Um, it also handles rendering of imagery into the device. Um, but the device API itself is pretty low level. So fortunately, you don't have to interact with that API yourself. Um, so there's already JavaScript libraries and built on top of that. Um, we'll talk about 3JS, but Babylon.js is another one. Uh, so we can move on to that. So 3JS, uh, so this is a pretty well-known JavaScript library. It's been around since 2010. Um, 3JS uses WebGL to build um, all sorts of 3D graphics. Um, it's a pretty complex library, so you have to be familiar with building scenes, cameras, animation, lights, materials, and shaders, um, objects, and all sorts of geometry. Um, code over here on the right kind of shows uh, the commands and steps here to, to create a scene and adding a camera. Uh, so we can take a look at an example of this. So I'm going to bring up my IDE. So if I go over to my IDE here, and again, this is in the uh, that GitHub repo. Uh, so I'll take a look at this 3JS example. So this is uh, the full code. This is the full code I, um, right here for 3JS. Um, and so if you look through this code, uh, I have a canvas set up here. I'm getting a reference to that canvas. Um, I'm pulling up the three WebGL renderer. I go through here and I create a camera, I create some controls, I create the scene, and then I start adding in some of the geometry, uh, so the cube, I'm adding a light in here, all adding this to the scene, and the remainder of code is go through the rendering. So we're doing a lot of that code there, and this is what it looks like. So we got this cube sitting here, this 3D cube, um, with the controls here, we can we can move it around. So this is the 3JS library and how you're able to do that. So next up is A-Frame. Uh, so A-Frame makes this a lot easier. Um, it's built on top of the 3JS library. Um, and it is entity and component based. So in 3JS, you have entities, which are container objects. And what you do is you attach components and components uh, have behavior. And so in this example here, I had this A box um, entity or container. And then we have uh, a position component. Um, this is a behavior for positioning the component within the 3D space. We have the rotation component that controls the rotation uh, around 
uh, yaw pitch and roll. And then a component that controls the, the color. Uh, what's nice about the A-frame uh, library in this entity component-based system is that these components are reusable and can be applied to different types of objects. And we'll get into that, how you can create your own objects uh, and primitives. So let's take a look at an example of using A-frame. So I'll take a look at the, this example right here. So in this, uh, in this code here, you see it's, it's just basic HTML code. And with the A-frame library, we're creating an A-scene. Uh, you're creating a camera. And you're adding a box to that scene. And we have some uh, components here, behavior for, again, position, rotation, and color. And then you can see what that looks like. So again, it's a cube here. You can still rotate it around. Um, but the thing I want to emphasize here is the, the complexity, right? So we let's go back to our 3JS example. This was a lot of code here to create that cube versus um, the A-frame example here, where now we're using tagging. It's 3JS behind the scene, but with the tagging, uh, just a fewer lines of code that we're able to create that environment. Go back to my browser. One thing I want to do is um, show some of these components. If I go to the A-Frame uh, website, I go over to Docs. A-Frame website has some pretty good documentation um, on the uh, different components and primitives. So if I go down here, over here on the left, you can see various components I have available. Um, things from like creating fog, GLTF models for 3D models, we have controls, uh, adding lights, position, uh, rotation. Those are ones you use quite a bit. And then another thing I want to show off the A-Frame website is they actually have some uh, a nice gallery here. You can see some examples here. So you can click on Hello VR. Uh, VR. So this is an A-Frame environment that was created. Uh, one thing that's really nice about the A-Frame library too is they provide an inspector by default. Uh, and so the shortcut to access this inspector is uh, control option A. Try that again. There we go. So any, any A-Frame scene that you create gets this inspector and you can launch it. And then what you can do is you can rotate around in the inspector, look at your, uh, your A-Frame scene over here on the left, you'll see all the entities that you've added to this scene. And then just by clicking on any entity, you can see the, the properties and the components that are associated with this. And so this is a great way to do some debugging. Okay, let me go back to my slides. So in A-Frame, uh, again, we have these entities, we have these components and primitives. So the fundamental uh, container within A-Frame is an A-entity tag. Um, and this is provided by default. So all types of objects and are inherit from A-entity. And then with this A-entity, you can apply different components. And so we have a geometry component, as you see in this example. Um, we can apply other components, like here's one for material where we apply a color red. Uh, I showed you there's a bunch of default components. Uh, position, rotate, and scale are components that are used quite a bit. Um, and it, here's an example of a primitive, and we'll get into that next, where you can take an entity like this uh, and make a primitive so that all you need to do is apply the tag and not have to worry about applying all these different components. Uh, one thing I'll also point out is when you create these using things like the position component, the rotation component, you need to be aware of the coordinate system uh, in the environment. So in the coordinate system, it uses the right-hand rule. So you have Z, the Z axis pointing straight at you. The Y axis is pointing straight up. And then the pitch, or sorry, the X axis is pointing to, to the side. 
And then you have the rotations as well. So you got pitch around the X, yaw around the Y, and, and roll around the Z. So let's talk about how we create our own components. So there were some default ones that were included, uh, but maybe we want to create our own. We want to create our own graphics. Um, A-Frame provides a way to do this. This uses the register component uh, method. And the way you do this is you use the register component. You provide a, a class as part of that, and you give that component a name. In this example here, it's rec-corners. You supply your input. And then you have to provide some lifecycle methods. So uh, the ones you use the most is init and update. So init does some initialization in the call. Um, update is called when you update any of these properties, but then you also have remove in case the objects are removed from the scene. You may want to have some cleanup code that executes. Uh, tick and talk are uh, lifecycle methods for uh, updating on the rendering loop. And if your object is animated in any way, um, you have lifecycle me methods for play and pause. Uh, so let's show an example here of how you create your own component and use it. So I'll go back to my IDE. So I have a component JavaScript file here, and we'll expand upon that rect corners uh, example you saw on the slide. So here we're registering a component called rect corners. Um, the inputs, attributes that we want for this component are width, height, radius, color, and opacity. And so what we're doing is basically we're going to draw a rectangle uh, and give it some radiuses. Pretty simple. So we've created a lifecycle method here to create a rect object. We're updating the opacity. And then uh, we are adding it to a, a group of objects in the scene, and that you do it through this set object 3D. Uh, but the real magic in this is this draw method. So let me scroll down to that. So this draw method is being called down here at the bottom. And this, again, is just using 3JS behind the scenes. So we, we're creating this rectangle shape. We're drawing this rectangle. We're applying the height, width, and radiuses to it. Uh, and then we're going, we're going ahead and create a shape buffer geometry. This is 3JS object. Um, and this allows it to get rendered as a component. So then we can take this and use this in our, uh, our A-frame HTML. So we have this scene, we have our A entity, but now we're applying this new component here. And then we're adding these attributes, height, height, width, and opacity, and position. And then we can see what that looks like. Click on that. So there we go. So that was the component that we just created. And we put it in our, in our scene. So we talked about how to create your component. Let's take it a step further and see how we can take that component to create our own primitive. Uh, and this is basically creating our own custom tag using that component. So what we'll do now is we'll take that rec corners component. Uh, we'll create a, a primitive called a-rec-corners. Uh, we'll specify that component and then we'll map some of the properties. So let's see an example of that one. All right. So... Here's our primitive JavaScript class. So same thing as before, we have this component here for rec corners. Uh, pay attention to the inputs for this component because we'll map these. Then I'll scroll down and we have a call to registered primitive. So we're gonna call this primitive a-rec-corners and this will end up being the tag that we use. Uh, we're specifying the default component to include. And then here, these are the attributes that will show up in a tag, and then we're mapping these to these component properties. So then to use this, I'll jump over to my HTML. We make sure we call this JavaScript uh, file. And so then we can use this tag uh, 
uh, specify these mapped attributes from the component. And then that's what it looks like. So now instead of a component attached to a entity, we can create our own custom primitive and our own custom tag to display this. So that was a, a good overview of a frame. So the other component of doing these dynamic WebXR experiences is Angular. Um, it doesn't have to be Angular. You know, there's other uh, UI frameworks out there like uh, you know React. Um, but this is one I chose. I, I like Angular. Um, so it's a full-fledged front-end framework. Um, compared with other frameworks, it has a lot of functionality that's already kind of provided. Um, there's less reliance on third-party libraries. Uh, the thing that I really like about it myself is I come from an object-oriented background, so I like uh, being able to create. Uh, it's a component-based framework, so I like that. I like being able to create classes. It's really focused on classes and ob I'm going to be able to do object-oriented ar architecture. Um, and I use inheritance quite a bit as well. Um, so components is important. We'll use that, you know, dynamic WebXR ex experience. And the data binding as well, is, we'll end up using that. So just a quick overview of Angular components. Um, so the way Angular is set up is you create a component with a decorator as part of a class. And so in the example here, I've created a, a component called my component. Um, the tag will be my component. Um, it's backed by an HTML. Uh, and the component class will control how the HTML is updated. And then you can optionally apply some uh, cascading style sheets to that HTML for additional styling. Uh, so let's see an example of this. Let me bring up my ID again. So a good example of this is um, this panel that we're going to use in the, in the bigger projects. So let me pull that up. So I'm looking at my Ag Angular projects here in the source directory. Um, in my project, I have this inspector view that you'll see later, and I have a panel in there that has, it's basically a form for updating objects. Uh, so let's take a look at my panel. There we go. So this, in this directory, I have the definition of the, the Angular component. Um, a module class is required when you want to share this component uh, and also references other, other modules that you use within your component. But the real core of this is the component class. And this is what you saw on the slide here. So the tag or the selectors will be this default thing in the jig panel. Um, this is backed by an HTML and a style sheet. So the HTML is a form using some uh, Angular material tags. And this form is backed by a model. So in this form, I'll be able to update some values. I'll be able to update a position. And this, this corresponds to the, that position component within the VR space. Um, rotation, you'll update rotation, scale, some fonts and font colors. Uh, the Thimajig component Two also has a 3D model, so we'll be able to update that. Uh, the next topic we'll talk about is Angular host binding. So this is mapping uh, the data from the model to that component I just showed you, which is the UI. Uh, there's numerous ways to do uh, binding, data binding from Angular. Um, the one we'll use for this is host binding. Uh, so what we'll end up doing is we'll be mapping uh, the attributes of our component or primitive to the model itself and be able to do dynamic updates that way. Uh, so let's take a look at an example of that. So I'll take a look at the component that, that we'll use to render uh, render our AR here. Oops, it's the wrong one. Yeah, so here we have another Angular component, and this will be used to render 
an object in our AR scene. Um, so what we want to look at here is here's where we're using the host binding. So we're creating a, a thingamajig uh, primitive. And so that primitive will have uh, some components and it has some attributes. Um, and so we'll dynamically update these attributes with Angular host binding. So we'll have a model that backs this. And whenever that model updates, we'll update these attributes and you can see that reflected in the scene. All right, so we, we've covered a lot of material there. Let's try and kind of sum this up uh, on how we're going to use these components here to provide a, a dynamic web XR experience. So the first thing we talked about is how to create your components uh, in A-frame. So we use this A-frame register component. Uh, again, this component controls behavior, uh, whether it's a color or maybe a rotation. Next thing uh, we talked about is being able to take those components and put those together in a primitive. Uh, and that would be a, like a custom tag potentially. And so we use the AFM register primitive to do that. So that gives us the tag. And then we'll use the Angular component here uh, to represent that tag, to hold the attributes. Um, so that here we can use host binding to update those attributes and have, provide dynamic changes within our, our web XRC. First thing uh, before we kind of move on into the, the bigger application here, it's just some quick notes on, on setup with Angular and A-frame in the environment. So uh, Angular is pretty well known. You just do, it's NPM based. You can use NPM install, uh, NPM install Angular CLI, and then you can use the Angular CLI command to create your app. Uh, A-frame, uh, similarly, uh, you can do NPM install on your A-frame library. But there's some things to note in the Angular uh, environment. So Angular uses polyfill uh, to provide some uh, uh, adjustments to provide browser support. So for A-frame, we do have to use polyfill to do some, some setup. Um, so in the polyfill for Angular, I'll show you what that looks like. Here's the polyfill file for Angular. So in the polyfill file, we do have to do an import here for A-frame. Um, I use some other A-frame libraries as well, and I also have to do a similar import. So I have something for orbit controls and does some controls within the, the WebXR scene. And then uh, I do some events as well. But you do need to include this A-frame here in your polyfill. Um, other things to note is uh, when you do deploy this, the WebXR API does re require HTTPS. And so uh, if you don't do that, um, you won't be able to render it properly. And so you might have to do it with a self-signed cert or use something like uh, uh, GitHub pages to, uh, to serve your uh, scene. Within the scene itself, uh, you should you need to include a camera and some look controls and some orbit controls. Um, I'll show an example of that in my IDE. So I have an, an AR component here that represents the whole scene that you'll see a little bit later. Uh, so in this scene here, my HTML black backing, I do include the, the A scene tag here, as well as a camera, the look controls. So the look controls allow you to um, uh, render in a headset and be able to move around in the headset, move the scene around. Uh, if you're not in a headset on the browser, you can use the mouse to move around. Uh, the orbit controls add some additional behavior for the camera. Um, so with this, what you're able to do is control the field of view. So we can position the camera uh, at the specific point in the coordinate space. And then we can actually position, uh, turn the camera to focus on this position. And then we can control here how far in and how far out you're able to uh, uh, adjust the camera. 
Uh, one other thing we need to talk about here is Angular state management. So in the application, I'll show you in just a bit, um, there's some actions that we'll take to create um, create the thing thingamajig object. Um, so we have a state machine that controls that. So in Angular state management, um, we create an action. It goes through a reducer. Um, it, gets, it goes to a store. And then those changes are reflected in the UI. So let me show you an example of that in code. So for our application here, This is what our, our, we have three classes here that control state management. Um, the first one I'll show you is, is state. So this is just an interface here um, where I'm, I'm storing the, the last action that was taken. There's this thingamajig primitive component that we'll, we'll add in here. So this will be an ID to it. And state, uh, we're storing current state, um, which is just a map of potentially multiple thingamajig models or objects. And then uh, we have undo and redo options available as actions. So we can, we can uh, store a past and a future state. And this is just the initial start state. Then we have the actions that we can, uh, we can initialize through our application. We can add a thingamajig component. We can undo and redo. Uh, I have an update here, but I, I don't have that wired up. And then lastly, we have the reducer, or I'm calling it the state engine here. So once we uh, submit an action, it goes to the state machine here. Uh, once I uh, add a thingamajig, it runs to this part. Uh, so I get, I get the current state. Uh, I'll clone it. In this case, I'm adding a thingamajig object. So I'm going to create a new one here with this default thingamajig model. Uh, I add it to the clone state. I make that clone state the present one, and I push the previous present to the past, and then that gives me the undo and redo functionality. So if I want to go back, I can I can do that. So that was a quick side tour of the state machine that we'll end up using. So now let's talk about the, the application I'm about to show you. So in this application, we're going to combine everything that I've, that we just learned in, in the previous slide. So uh, we're going to create an app, we're going to have an action here. We create a thingamajig component. Uh, or it ends up being a primitive that goes to our state machine. That state machine will then create a thingamajig model. Uh, and then on the UI side of things, we're going to have a property panel where we can make updates to uh, the primitive properties through the model. And then, then those changes will be reflected uh, in the primitive itself. So give me one moment here. Let me run through the code just real quick uh, before we jump into it. So So I want to show you where the components and primitives are being created. So we have this AR component here that represents the, the AR scene. And so I have a component here that I've created called an access component. Um, and this just gives me uh, XYZ axis that you'll see. So that's, that's a component called axis. And then I've created a, a thingamajig card primitive. And that's, this is the A thingamajig. And then I'm using a default component called text that allows me to add some text to it. I'm also using a, a default component called GLTF model. This is, gives me a 3D model. Now I'm specifying a, an asset for that, a 3D object asset for that. And then I am reusing my axis component that I created up here as part of this primitive. And now I'm mapping some of the, com uh, the component properties like text for the font color value and alignment uh, to these primitive attribute values. And I'm also mapping uh, the 3D object uh, to the source property. Um, so this allowed me to change the 3D object module model, and you'll see how that works. 
Uh, and then to kind of kick this all off, we have this AR view component. Uh, and then we have a method here called add new thingamajig. And this kicks off our state machine. Uh, so this will call a dispatch with the action add thingamajig. And that will run through that state machine that I showed you earlier. It'll create that model. Uh, and then this primitive will get created within our scene. Okay, so let me show you what the working example looks like. So I have this running right now locally. So all that code created this, what you're looking at right here. So we have this web XR view, uh, and this is where our thingamajig primitive will be created. Uh, and over this expect area, this is where that thingamajig panels will show up. So let me just go ahead and kick off this action here. So I'll say add thingamajig component. Uh, I say click there, and then here we go. So we had that thingamajig primitive that I created, it gets created here. Uh, what we can do is I can show you where that's at over here in the Chrome developer tools code. Click on that. So here we go. So you hear, here's the primitive and the custom tag that I created, a thingamajig. Um, it was dynamically added here. If I wanted to, I can come over and add another one. Uh, so you'll see an additional tag show up here. So now we have two thingamajigs. They're on top of each other. Uh, so what we can do is I could take one of these. Uh, and here's here's the panel that I showed you earlier in code. This is what it looks like it's rendered. And so I can go through here and I can, let's just move it the other way. There we go. So I moved it over so you can see that we have two components here. Uh, one thing to also notice is I can dynamically update this. Uh, so. This one here I have is normal Spidey. I can click on that and say, well, I want Morales Spidey. So then we can use the control to zoom out. Um, let me do that one more time so you can see, if you look over here on, at, at this code, you'll see this dynamically update. So now it's, it's Morales using this asset. And then you see it was dynamically updated and it's re-rendered. So the idea here is going to show you how you can dynamically create these web XR scenes. And so the next step for this is to uh, go ahead and render this in some sort of device. And so, so this will be a, a step that you will have to do. It's, it's hard to show this um, in, a Zoom, in a Zoom conference call. Uh, but if you go to this link here, uh, I have a, a a frame scene that reflects what we just did, and so if you click on this link in your in your device, which you'll end up seeing, because this is an a frame, you'll get this option here of AR or VR. Um, what you want to do is click on the AR button, and then uh, it may prompt you to do uh, enable it, allow you to do this, say allow, and then what you're able to do is take that Spider Man and then place him within your room or scene. So that's something that you can do. And that finishes up my session. Uh, again, I wanna show you the show notes again. Um, go ahead and go to this link um, and you have the opportunity to uh, register with a free t-shirt and you'll get the slides and the video posted a little bit later.